Thank you. Thank you. Those are beautiful testimonies. <laughs> yeah, I want to have that 16-year-old pray for all of us. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> we did have a great time yesterday. How many of you were there yesterday? Let's see. Oh, quite a few of you. Good. It's always a little difficult. Uh, I was saying this to Leanne. After you've done something, you know, for a full day, you feel like you're part of everything. And then you start over with a new group the next morning. Uh, but but I could see there's just a lot of love in this church, and uh, I was telling the group yesterday, I really love Iowa, and I love Iowans. Do you say Iowans? <laughs> Is that right? We've had so much fun walking around this little town and uh, looking at the windmills, and uh, just it's just the sweetest thing, and the tulips are amazing. I've taken so many pictures of tulips, you know, <laughs> and I don't know who to show them to, but... <laughs> It's, you know, it's like my son one time took a thousand pictures of orchids in St. Louis at an orchid show, and I said, what are you going to do with those? He said, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? But anyway, a place that loves people and a place that loves God's nature and God's creation is a beautiful place. Uh, so we're, we're just really happy to be with here with you. I'm with Ken and Sue, who are Iowans uh, that are part of Christian Healing Ministries staff, and also Leah and Rummel, who came all the way uh, just to, to be here and support us in this ministry and to pray with you. She's chair of our board at Christian Healing Ministries. So you can say hello to them after the service. You know, there's so many things to talk about, and I am going to take my watch off so I can remember to stop. Uh, I, the group learned yesterday, I can really, there's just after... Uh, collectively, my husband and I have been in the healing ministry for over 100 years. Uh, he turns 90 this Wednesday. And uh, so I say most of that's on his side, but <laughs> I have been in the ministry for 40 years, so you can do the math. But anyway, there's so many things to talk about, but as I was praying last night and then uh, early this morning, I felt like what God would have me share with you this church, which I believe God is so proud of. He said that yesterday. He is so proud of this church uh, because you're really doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know, so I just want to come alongside and encourage you to do more always. But I think to talk about something that um, as a psychotherapist I see as one of the greatest needs and as someone in the healing ministry is to begin to pray more, and especially in your families. You know, the kingdom of God, when Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God is all around you. The kingdom of God is near. And of course, the kingdom of God means, the actual meaning of it is the rule and reign of God in your life. And the kingdom, I was reading in Matthew this morning, you can kind of go through Matthew, and he sh he's got more on the kingdom of God than the other gospel writers and he said, it's like a woman who took yeast, you know, and she put it in her flour and it expanded. Or it was like a man who found a pearl of great price. And it's like a mustard seed, you know, and you plant the mustard seed and it grows into the largest tree and everyone makes a home in it. So the kingdom of God, as I was taught when I lived in Israel by my pastor who taught on it the whole time I lived in Israel, he never changed subjects. He never did. He said, I'll change subjects when you get it. And we never, I guess we never got it. So he stayed all the kingdom of God. But what he said there is it's an ever-expanding community of believers that are under the lordship and the rule and reign of Jesus. So that's basically the kingdom. And it just grows and grows. Every time you pray with someone, every time you speak the gospel to someone, Every time you love someone, you've pushed back the kingdom of darkness and you've welcomed in the kingdom of God. And this is how the world will be converted. It's not by passing out tracts and four spiritual laws and all those things that I used to do in Boston and Harvard Square, you know, and everybody take it, look at it and throw it away. You know, I found out it's about loving each other, isn't it? It's about praying with one another. And I love this church because it's so centered on prayer. I just love that. And God loves that. But basically, the first community that we come into is our family. 
It's our family. And the church that I grew up in, they probably encouraged us to pray. I'm not sure. I don't want to be critical of them because that's my roots and I love my roots. But at the same time, none of the families prayed together. None of the families prayed together. And I'm here today to challenge you. If you don't already, I see all these beautiful little children here. If you don't already pray in your family, I'm here to really challenge you to daily pray in your family, to daily protect your family, to cover your family, to love them as Jesus has called you to love them. When I was in private practice, um, there was this judge, and she was one that would grant divorces, of course. It was a divorce court, kind of like Judge Judy or some of those on TV probably, you know, which I hate those. I hate all those. But anyway, she before she would grant a divorce, she would send the couples to me because uh, I had this private practice. And I would, uh, only thing I did, this is the God's truth, I loved them and I got them to pray together. And they were Christians, many of them. If they weren't, we worked on that. <laughs> but I, I'm here to tell you that not one divorce happened of the ones that committed to praying together. Isn't that beautiful? And that was a period of years where she just thought I was a miracle worker. You know, she just thought, whatever you do in therapy, I said, no. No, it's not the therapy. I mean, I did therapy with them in counseling. But I said, what we do is we get them to pray together. And that's difficult if you've never done it, isn't it? If you've have never had that modeled in your own childhood, what does that really look like to come together in your family and pray? You know, and my husband and I teach about uh, physical healing, inner healing, generational healing, uh, deliverance from evil, all of those things. But it all begins with prayer. And it's not good to try and start a prayer life in a crisis. Have you ever tried that? Help. You know, <laughs> they asked John Wimber what was his favorite prayer, and he said, help, help. <laughs> you know, and that is the, the briefest, shortest, and those are answered. But I wanted to just share a little bit with you about this. Uh, we are created for relationships. That's what we were created for. The perfect relationship is in the Trinity. The unity that's in the Trinity. Every, all of life, all of everything comes out of the Trinity, doesn't it? And it's just this beautiful. I had a bishop that heard me speak in Texas one time. And we, I was talking about praying in tongues, you know, your prayer language. And he said the way he understands that is it's the Holy Spirit praying the perfect prayer to God the Father. And the Father and Jesus say amen. So it's like there's this perfect unity. And you know, in John 17, Jesus prayed, Lord, may they be one as we are one. Remember that? And so unity is at the heart of the Father, love and unity. And he calls us to unity in our churches, in our families, in our friendships. To, to really, truly love one another as he has loved us. And there's so many of us that don't even know how much he loves, you know, so that you find that out when you're praying together. I had this couple in Hawaii. This is really kind of a funny story. I was training uh, on prayer, and, and they asked me if I'd do something on marriage. So kind of on the lunch break, I brought all these couples in. It was about a group about this size. And I was going to work with them on prayer and communication. And there was this couple sitting on the front row, and they had five children. And the children stayed in the meeting, of course. Some of them were teenagers. And I said, well, I need a couple to volunteer, and I'm going to teach you how to listen to each other and how to pray together. And so this man, and the stage was about this high, this big man, he was about six foot eight, and he had a Nike shirt on. I, I still remember that, big, bold Nike. And he got up and he said, and these were his words, 
as his wife is following him up, am I going to win at this? <laughs> Those were his words, and I thought, we have a problem in Houston. We have a problem. I said, well, there's no winners in this. And he went, oh, you know, like, because he's a real sports guy, you know, the Nike. And the beautiful thing is, I had him sit in chairs knee to knee, you know, and talk about what they needed prayer for and how to listen. And every time his wife would say, I need for you to do this, he would start defending himself. And I said, no, no, you're just supposed to listen. Well, after that, his children started correcting him. And they'd say, Dad, you're not listening. You're not listening. And I thought, this is a family issue, isn't it? And I've learned as a therapist, we don't know how to listen to each other. We really don't. We're, it's, like, it's like a courtroom. You know, one of, I may start being critical of my daughter, or she may be, let's say she's being critical of me, which happens frequently. <laughs> and she's like correcting me, you know. And I start to get defensive. And I start to say, well, well, what did you think or what did you expect, you know? And, and then we get into this place because she's just like me. That's our problem. And she's just like me. We get into this place where we're in the courtroom. We're defending each other or myself. I'm defending myself. Do you ever do that in your marriage or in your family? Well, it's not loving each other, is it? So what we, what we have to do is begin to pray in simple ways. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about because you're in a relationship because God placed you where you are. Whether it's your marriage, whether it's your family of origin, your parents, for you young people, whether it's a friendship, if you're not in a marriage, you need prayer partners, Leanne and the people that are with me here. There are people I call when I need help, when I need prayer, you know, and I rely on them. And so yesterday in, in our conference, John 15, that love one another as I've loved you is where we start. And that's a high bar, isn't it? That's a high bar, to love as Jesus loved. And how do we do that? How do we do that? We do that when we come into his presence we acknowledge that he is Lord over our family, over our friendships, over our lives, and we just simply listen to one another. Do you know every affair that I ever worked, every marriage where there had been an affair, adultery, every single one of them said, I found someone to listen to me. And that was the extramarital affair. I found someone who understood me. You see, this is what our heart wants. Our heart wants to be listened to. Our heart, when we're hurting, whatever it happens to be. So, we begin in our home, not in a crisis. And the Lord gave me a neat little thing this morning. I've never taught this before. A friend of mine many years ago, and this is kind of a popular one. How many of you have heard the word act? And that, that's the prayers, you know, all that. Uh, he gave me a little, little more. He said, PACT, P-A-C-T. And then he put a plural on it. And so I just want to tell you, this is the way we pray in our family. I've never taught it like this. But the first one, of course, PACT means an agreement or a covenant, doesn't it? So you're entering into, with your spouse a covenant agreement with your children, a covenant agreement. And the first letter, P, you're going to pray for protection. How many of you know that you have an enemy? It's not your wife. <laughs> it's not your husband. It's not your teenager who's out of control. Oh, that, that can feel that way sometimes. It's not your boss. It's not your pastor. It's not your best friend that's turning on you. You have an enemy. I've just written from my latest book many more pages than they're going to want at the publisher. I couldn't stop on spiritual warfare, angels and spiritual warfare, and what we need to know about the enemy. So when we pray in the morning, and I'm going to tell you how we pray at CHM, and we have these prayers on our website, we 
pray to bind the enemy from our family. Uh, and I'll just keep this to family right now. To bind the enemy. So we say something like, in the name of Jesus Christ, and no matter how old you are, you can pray these prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ and by his authority, I bind every demon that has been assigned to our family. In the name of Jesus Christ. Because there are assignments against every family. And if you're in ministry, and you're, I don't, I don't mean pastoring or leading, but if you're in any kind of ministry, there's even more assignments. But the good news is, if you're in ministry, you get a lot more angels than your guardian angel. Okay? So, we do the binding prayers. We also break any prayers, hexes, curses, or spells that have been sent against us. And I know that sounds medieval to, to modern day ears, but uh, read Derek Prince's book, Curses or Blessing, and find out about all the ways that you can be cursed, you can come under attack. So the, the second prayer we pray is in the name of Jesus Christ, we break every prayer hex curse spell that's been sent against our family. And we declare them null and void today. Isn't that, isn't that simple? Just simple prayers of protection. If we have friends of ours that are in our community that won't even get out of bed till they pray those prayers. And uh, it's not a bad thing. And at bedtime... We pray those prayers of protection for our sleep, for our dreams, for any visions God wants to give us. You know, we want our, our mind to be available to God. And so that's the protection prayers that we pray. And the other part of that protection prayer is asking God's holy angels to come and guard us. And uh, I tell you, I've, I have... For 40 years, been gathering angel stories, and I wish I could just stand here and tell you every single one of them for your encouragement. Our daughter, uh, when she was 17 years old, was driving down one of our main highways in Jacksonville on her way to school, and an uninsured drunk driver pulled out in front of her it wasn't even a highway. He'd been back kind of in the woods drinking. He pulled out in front of her. It's a three lane. She's, you know, three lanes going in one direction. And she had the peace of mind to realize that if she changed lanes, she would cause other people to die. And so she just said, Jesus slammed on the brakes. She's in a little sports car and he's in a big truck. And she went right up under the truck. And the whole front of the car came in, the glass came in, the airbag came out. And she didn't have a scratch on her. She didn't have any harm. But she got out of the car, managed to get out of the car. And she was in shock. So she's wandering around in the traffic. And this black bishop in a purple shirt, little collar, came and got her and said, you need to come back to the side of the road. He held her. He prayed for her. He comforted her. The police arrived. He disappeared. And she said, where is that bishop? I want to thank him. And the police said, when we got here, you were standing there alone. Isn't that beautiful? See, angels, all of you have a guardian angel. But if you're in ministry, you have more. Trust me, the evil is escalating. We need the holy angels in our lives, don't we? So that's part of the protection prayer. The next level we go to, Francis and I, is what we call adoration or worship. Just begin to worship the Lord like you did here this morning. That worship has to be in your home too. That worship, I put, we put on worship music. I dance with my dog. My dog loves to worship. She just comes and gets up and dances around. She'll even get up and let me hold her paws, you know. She gives out on that after about two minutes because it hurts her legs, I think. And, and their other little dog, he turns in circles. He's a little terrier. 
His name's Wyatt Earp because my daughter rescued him in Oklahoma <laughs> and brought him back to me. Yeah. So he, when we worship, runs in circles barking that yappy hate. I hate that bark, you know, just so I have to kind of override that. But worship, read the Psalms out loud. Sing the Psalms out loud. You know, that's a wonderful way to worship. Put on worship music. Then the next one is confession. Now, I can't tell you how important confession is in your family. You know, if you know you did something wrong, you know, fess up. Say, and don't say only, I'm sorry. Say, please forgive me. I'm sorry is beautiful, but it doesn't carry the weight of please forgive me. And then pray together. Because as I was teaching their group yesterday, when we sin against one another, it creates wounds in our hearts. And we have to pray to heal those wounds. So confession, clear the air. Just clear the air. And you know, confession is good to do every night. Do you ever do that as a married couple? One of the things Francis and I love to do is we... Um, First say, before we go to bed, what we're thankful for that day. And then what we're not thankful for that day. And we put that in God's hands and we pray about it. And so confession is really good. It says it's good for the soul. And then thanksgiving. Giving thanks for good things. I just read this morning in Ephesians where Paul was in prison. And here he is, he's chained in prison, and he's giving thanksgiving to God. Isn't that, isn't that just such a beautiful example? So anyway, thanksgiving is really important. And the last one is supplication. Most people I find when they pray, they go right into asking God for things. You know, Lord, bless us with this, bless us with that. And that really should be like the last thing when we bring our requests to God. Lord, this is what, please bless our children as they go off to school today. Please take care of this financial situation we're in, Lord. My husband who's sick, please send your healing power into his body. And then, this is the way Francis and I discovered to pray many years ago, and we still do it. After we go through this, and of course, scripture reading is always wonderful just in your daily devotion. But the way we've learned to pray is to just lay hands on each other. And sometimes I just put my head in his lap, like we always pray on the couch, and he just prays for me. He lays his hands on me, and he prays in the spirit. He prays in tongues. And he just prays for me. And you know, I never want him to stop. But what a blessing to have my husband do that and really bless me and bless my day. And I just get filled up with the love that he has for me and with the love that God has for me. And there's some days when I come home, like I've had a really difficult day at the ministry. You know, we're dealing with really life and death issues all day long. Our kids even laugh about this. You can't say anything is wrong with your body or how you're feeling in front of Francis because he'll always say, let me pray with you right now. Let me pray with you right now. I've never known anyone that trusts God as much or has as great a faith or that heart of compassion. And everybody at work knows that. If, he walk, if you walk in and say, I have a headache, oh, sit down. I'm like, too bad, take an aspirin, you know. <laughs> We're busy. We're praying for all these other people. Get over it, you know. No, I'm not that, quite that bad, but I feel like I am compared to him. So it's just so beautiful to pray that way. And then, of course, I pray for him that way. When I was growing up, I had a mother who believed in healing prayer. My father didn't become a Christian until he was healed of cancer later in life. My husband and I laid hands on him. He confessed his sins, lifetime confession. And he was instantly healed of cancer and didn't have to have the surgery and lived another 20, 25 years. But when I was a little girl, I was healed of asthma by my mother's prayers. And it was a life-threatening asthma. 
I was hit by a car. It was a very serious accident. Um, the school, the high school, I was in middle school, and the high school was at the end of the street. And it was prom night. And you know how young girls are about prom dresses. It's like, oh, my gosh. And this little boy's looked at me like, what's the big deal about a prom dress? You know, <laughs> who cares about a prom dress? You will someday. <laughs> but I said, I begged and begged and begged, please let me go and see the prom dresses. You know, I'll ride my bicycle just in the end of the street. And finally, my mother relented, and she said, sure. And so I drove my little bicycle down there. There was a young man that had already been out drinking, and he should not have been driving, and he ran over me twice. First, he knocked me off the bike, then he backed over me. And uh, they carried me home, because we had no hospital. It was in eastern Kentucky. They carried me home, and they laid me on the bed, and the little country doctor who had delivered me came over and started crying, and he said, she won't make it through the night. He said, don't even take her to the hospital. And my mother, because the hospital is two and a half hours away, my mother said, we'll see. And she sat there and laid hands on me and prayed. And a few days later, I woke up when my brain swelling went down. And she said, she didn't go, oh, praise God, a miracle, you've been resurrected and all that. She said, are you hungry? <laughs> Isn't that a mother? Isn't that a mother? Are you hungry? And I said, yeah, yeah, what happened? You know, it was like, what happened? And you know what I said, how's my bicycle? <laughs> Dad's, Dad's weeping, you know. He said, we'll get you another bicycle. Isn't that beautiful? See, that's a praying mother. She wouldn't accept. And... Uh, I just want to really encourage you. There's healing to be had in your families. There's deliverances that your family needs. It's a very dark time that we're in. Families are under attack from this culture, which belongs to the enemy. You know, and I won't even go into how shocked I am of what I see, you know, in Hollywood and in television and all that. You all know all that. But there, there's, there's a battle for the soul of your family, for your church. And you have to be a warrior. You have to be a warrior. You have to have the angels of God on your side. You have to understand the supernatural realm. You have to understand the assignments that could be against you for physical disease for emotional sicknesses, whatever. You've got, to, you've got to kind of put your armor on and put the armor on your children. When David was a little boy, we bought both Rachel and David armor in a Christian bookstore. And, you know, it was Roman, like Roman armor. You know, it was all plastic, of course. And uh, David wore it solid every day, day and night for a month. Uh, he never took it off. He had that little sword like this, you know. And uh, Rachel looked at it and left it and never put it on, you know. So, and that's interesting now that they're older because she's becoming more interested in that, but he's always been a warrior. It's kind of interesting. I used to go in and take it off of him at night, but I'd put his sword by the bed so he could, you know, get it real quick <laughs> if he needed it. <laughs> so, you know, te teach your children to be warriors, teach them to pray in a crisis, not in a crisis only. Teach them to pray for you. When I was on the radio the other day, uh, I'll tell this story that Ed Francis was out one night. He was always out when I needed him, and he was always out praying for other people, you know, at a healing service or something. And this one particular night, Rachel and David were in the bathtub, and they had all their little toys and soap, and they were just having the greatest time in the bathtub. And I used to get migraine headaches. And uh, I would thank God, you know, I've been healed of that. But I walked in the bathroom, and you get this look when you have a migraine headache. You know, it's really an awful look because it's pain. I mean, you know, you can't stand light. You can't stand anything. 
And there they were, and they were so happy. They were so happy. And I was like, mm -hmm. be nice, be nice, you know. And they looked at me, and they said, are you okay? I said, no, Mommy's got a headache. And they looked at each other like they'd seen Godzilla, you know. It was like, oh, my gosh, where's Dad, you know, or... And they looked at each other, and then these four little soapy heads came out of the bathtub. David said, kneel down, Mom. <laughs> and I knelt right there, two naked children. I knelt down by the bathtub, <laughs> put my head down. And I, I still remember David couldn't even talk plain yet. It's like, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. And then Rachel said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> It was the sweetest thing. Please heal mommy. Please heal mommy, please. Daddy's not home. Please heal mommy. <laughs> it was the sweetest prayer I think I've ever had prayed over me. And in an instant, I was healed. Isn't that beautiful? And I thought, thank God we taught them to pray. Today, they'll pray for anyone. They'll... they'll they call us from New York City or South America, wherever they are, and say, you know, will you pray? Will you pray? This is the legacy. I want to leave you with that, moms and dads and grandparents and friends. This is your legacy to your children. This is your legacy to your grandchildren. It's not the money. It's not the homes. It's not the jewelry. Your legacy is an eternal legacy to your family, if you teach them early on to pray and in your marriages to begin to pray daily. Thank you, and God bless you. Hey. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.